Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. We have the deities of humans. We have the de major deities, which cross the line between the species and are worshipped by many. We have the demi-human deities, and quite often in my videos you'll hear about the non-human deities, the gods of the monstrous races, so-called. Today we have a patron request to talk about the god of the kobolds, Kutulmak. So this is a fairly involved story that is documented mainly in the grand history of the realms, uh, Races of the Dragon, and Dragon Magazine number 63, but the information about the other kobold gods took me all over the place. Um, so forgive me if I go off on tangents and talk about the Great Eladrin migration and the wars between the giant empire of Astoria and the dragons and the war between the dragons themselves. But it's all connected and um, I kind of like to cement this tale in the time period to give you some signposts so you know when this all happened. It really sort of puts it in perspective when you know what the elves were doing at this time and what the Yuanti and, and various on. Because it was a long, long time ago and it set the stage for a lot of things which happened since then. It all begins with uh, Asgarath, the dragon deity of creation, regarded by the dragons to be the creator of the multiverse and of course of dragon kind and by extension all draconic life forms and possibly um, due to Asgarath, they, they've got an inflated opinion of their own position in the universe as you know. This entity is unusual in that it represents all possibilities, so is of all different alignments, it's both male and female, also without form or with form, depending on what it wants to be. It's a deity and a primordial. In fact, Asgarath never manifests in its totality uh, because it's simply impossible for one reality to contain it all. The oldest myths of Dragonkind claim that Asgarath manifested physically only once during the act of creating the multiverse. Those who believe in this myth believe Asgarath is so huge that even its scales are larger than the largest dragon that ever existed. Really, any conversation with the supremely arrogant dragons about their gods is kind of predictable. Whatever your gods can do, theirs did it much better and did it first. However, most dragons have had little time for worship of gods, and there is a pretty good reason for that. I'll talk about that later on in the video. In the Outer Plains, Asgarath manifests mainly as Io. His holy symbol is a simple circle representing that he encompasses everything and maybe that he has no real beginning or end. And before you tell me that Io died during the Dawn War, let, rem let me remind you that this that beings this powerful not only exist beyond the limitations of space, they also exist beyond the limitations of linear time. And no, I can't put this into a cohesive narrative context because, well, because I'm just a mortal man and nobody really curates this stuff like they probably should have, so I'm going to do the best I can. And if you're just playing second edition anyway, IO is still around. And sometimes this lore is like herding cats, what can I say? Okay, let's just stick with the kobolds. Where did they come from? Dara Shiva Thit Cha, Dara Striva Thicha, was an ancient dragon kingdom ruled by Kaysen's Jack, a mighty green dragon. Among its vassal states was Dara Strix's Herthi, a nation of kobolds ruled by her spawn, Kirtlemuk, located in what is now the Shoal of Thirst. And when I say her spawn, really um, Kirtlemuk was the child of Tiamat, a very important one, as we shall discover. Um, but of course, there's many different versions of this, as you'll, as you'll find out as well. So when did this happen? When exactly were the kobolds created? The Dragonfall Wars was, and still is, the conflict between the followers of Bahamut and Tiamat. It began in the Time of Dragons, a period that lasted about six millennia around, uh, from around minus 30,000 Dale Reckoning. The Dragonfall War began when followers of Zymor, a disciple of Bahamut, slew Nagamat, of a worm general of Tiamat. Tiamat responded by unleashing all sorts of dra dragon-like beings during the war, breeding warped creatures from her own eggs. These aberrant entities became known as the spawn of Tiamat. To counter them, Bahamut created his own agents, originally from the ranks of his paladins, basically volunteers, which is where we get the first dragonborn, where they came from. You can get more details on that in my video on the dragonborn themselves. 5,000 years later, the thousand-year war between the dragons and giants came to an end. Astoria has shrunk to a fraction of its former size on the north of the continent of Faerun. The draconic civilization is similarly devastated by this genocidal conflict, and the elves, long and oppressed people, create the Draco Rage Mythal as a far, in a far northern citadel, with the coming of this king's killer star, so they sort of capitalized on that magical energy. It ex um, this incites the first rage of dragons, driving dragons insane, 
and all dragons launched into destructive rampages and battle both each other and their offspring and all of their followers. It's interesting to note that this is a hundred years before Lolf even takes an interest in the elves of Toril. So there's no drow at this point in history. The drow never, were never enslaved by dragons. The elven relationships with dragons is not exactly oppressors and oppressed either. The sun elves, who were um, known as the gold elves when they came over from the Feywild, have a mighty tradition of dragon riders who feature heavily in the very early history. When the sun and moon elven nations came to Faerun, which by the way means the one land in elven, the elves had arrived as refugees from Tintagir in the Feywild. The sun elf priestess, um, priestess Bonaluri died in the effort of keeping the magical gateway open long enough for all of her people to arrive in, uh, in the northern parts of Faerun. Anyway, they arrived as refugees in a world already at war, with dragons and giants fighting this crazy conflict over the bones of the ancient empires of reptiles, amphibians, and semi-draconic bird people. With uh, primitive humans and dwarves, Yuan-Ti, lizard folk, all manner of threats coming in from all sides, they lashed out to break the back of the most dominant species on the planet, which was the dragons, and they created the Draco Rage. The Draco Rage. I mean, fair enough. First the war with the giants, and then the outbreak of a horrendously dangerous religious war between the dragons themselves. It was the only thing the elves could do to protect them, themselves and the other humanoid races of the world. But it caused as much devastation and destruction as it was supposed to prevent in the long term, really, since uh, the dragons were so pivotal to, uh, to so many different things. During the first rage of dragons, Kaysen's Jack and her fellow dragons destroyed Dara Scriver Threcha and its vassal states, and in the process, killing most of the kobolds in the world of Toril, including their leader, Kirtlemach. Meanwhile, a young species, a species of flying kobolds called the Erd, um, who had challenged, uh, to, who had alleged to their own uh, leader, um, Kala Yur, uh, Kura, Kura Uliek, took to the air and escaped. They were supposed to be basically warning the um, kobolds of any approaching danger. Before this devastation happened, the kobolds, prodigious miners and craftspeople, uh, found the gems, which were the souls of the gnomes, waiting to be turned into living creatures and enslaved by, um, they got enslaved by um, the kobolds. Um, and also the ones who already lived were enslaved by the kobolds, mostly anyway. Gal Glittergold immediately seized the opportunity of the destruction um, caused by the Draco Rage during the imminent destruction of Dara Strivitrecha to loot all the gems and rescue unborn gnomish souls. Really, it was kind of absent-minded and careless of Gal to leave those gems in the caverns at the heart of the mountain anyway. He probably should have paid more attention to the prime material worlds and less attention to the relatively sedate goings-on in the twin paradises of Bytopia. However, the eternal vigilance sworn by Kirtlemach against Ga uh, vengeance a sworn by Kirtlemach against Gaal and all the gnomes is a bit extreme, all things considered. I suspect Kirtlemach has more than a little streak of his mother's evil in him, and thus his children, the kobolds, slides all too easily into the ways of evil. Uh, Kirtlemach is well known to have neither compassion nor a sense of humour. At this point, the kobolds and Erd were in absolute chaos and may well have perished, but Asgarath elevated Kirtlemach and Kura Uliak to godhood, which saved them, even though the Erd have pretty much been universally despised by the kobolds for abandoning them as their city was destroyed and Kirtlemach died. Um, kobolds still cohabitate with the Erd occasionally though, which makes for... Um, Sometimes it's kind of interesting. Kirtlemach, meaning to survive in Turkish, by the way, became the chief deity worshipped by the kobold race. Kirtlemach received the portfolio roles of trap making, mining and war, which brought him to the attention of major gods who controlled these portfolios, because now some of their power was flowing to and from Kirtlemach, though he was really just a blip in their mighty cosmic radar. He was still a lesser god. Kirtlemach's priests wear orange scale mail and iron helms. His sacred animal is the rook, which is a member of the family of birds that include crows and ravens, uh, corvettes. Kirtlemach is worshipped at the crescent moon in cave temples. His temples are carved out of earth and house his adepts, clerics, and the tribe's most valuable treasures. These temples are protected by small twisting tunnels and a staggering array of deadly traps, as you would expect. Um, I mean, he's a god of traps, but really... 
just go nuts with traps to a hilarious degree. He is the god of traps and a, to a species that is renowned for their trap making skills. This is the sort of dungeon temple that you take out those old books of traps and just have at it. It's just a cornucopia of nasty. The enemies of kobolds are sacrificed to Kirtlemak monthly under the crescent moon in a very brutal and gory ceremony. Lots of hooks and knives, ritual anointments with foul substances, skinning people alive, that sort of thing. The prayers, prayers to Kirtlemak have a rhythmic rhyming quality to them that can easily be recited while swinging a pickaxe uh, by kobolds who are prodigious miners. Prayers can also take the form of battle cries and promises of revenge. Uh, for instance, by the point of Kirtlemak's spear and the tip of his poisonous tail, I will see, see every member of your family perish, is a very common battle cry heard time and time again by large humanoids invading kobold lairs. But of course, it's shouted in their own language, yip yak. So it just sounds like high pitched dog growls, barks, yips, and hisses. Yeah, sort of loop, kind of loses its um its oomph. According to kobold religion, so this is their own beliefs. Uh, Kirtlemak and every kobold by extension owes his existence to an assault launched on Tiamat by an army of thieves shortly after she laid her first clutch of eggs. This may have been um, launched by Bahamut, who knows. Badly injured and with her lair heavily damaged, she caused one of her eggs to hatch prematurely, thus creating Kirtlemak. The newly hatched godling, so he is already a godling by this stage, by, uh, by extension because he was born of Tiamat, who's a dragon god herself. So technically he would have been a demigod to begin with. The newly hatched godling quickly began creating a defensive perimeter of traps and restoring the caverns. During the process, Kirtlemak found an egg of Tiamat's that had fallen away from the nest and it had been deemed um, to have been away too long from the nest to ever have tr ever hatched naturally. Using his magic, and some say that he stole his sorceress magic from another dragon god and gave it to his offspring, using his magic to, to cause it to hatch, thus producing miniature versions of himself, the first kobolds. This is not actually true, but kobolds never believe otherwise. They do have several versions of this mythology though. Several versions exist. Um, in the first, Gal Glittergold is said to have collapsed Kurt Kirtlemak's hall while the kobold deity was hosting Asmodeus. In a second version of this myth, uh, featured in Dragon Magazine's Ecology of the Kobold, Kirtlemak decided to carve out a great cavern and, ring it, and rig it to collapse himself, whereupon he would then play a jest, he would invite all of the other racial deities to the cavern for a feast, whereupon he would tell them the tale of the violation of Tiamat's lair, and at the tale's end he would pull an ornate stone trigger and bury the assembled host deities alive. The subsequent turn of events differs on whether the myth teller is a kobold or a gnome, but either way, Gal Glittercold stumbled across Kirtlemak's cavern and pulled the trigger, bearing the god of the kobolds in his own trap. What a prank. The kobold version insists that Gal Glittergold did so because he was jealous of Kirtlemak's creation, whilst the gnomish version claims that Gal admired Kirtlemak's work and pulled the keystone out simply to see if it worked, soon forgetting about all the um, all forgetting all about the event. A third version of the story is found in the Book of the Races of the Dragon. When Io gave the secret of creation to the first true dragons, the first dragon to use that secret was Kaysensjak, a green dragon. The first kobold was Kirtlemak, and because he was first, he was much larger than his younger kin. Kaysensjak chose the command of uh, chose to command new creations through Kirtlemak, and he ascended to a position of leadership, just naturally. When Kaysenstack told the kobolds to mine for precious metal, Kirtlemak invented the pickaxe. So, uh, when she ordered them to tie, tile her lair with gold, Kirtlemak minted the first trick on a coin. And when she told them to mine precious stones, Kirtlemak taught himself sorcery to divine where the minerals were located. When Kaysenstack's lair was finished and she became the wealthiest dragon in creation, she let the kobolds go free. In emulation of his former mistress, Kirtlemak immediately began mining a lair for himself. Although he never asked for help, he nonetheless received it. Every kobold he had ever worked with came to his aid, and they worked together as one people. Kirtlemak found a spot with a near limitless supply of metal ore and precious stones. With Kirtlemak commanding the operation, it quickly became the most structurally sound and resourceful, uh, resourcefully designed mine the world had ever seen, and Kirtlemak called it uh, Dara Strix Herthy. A fortress fit for dragons. Nothing rivaled it. Gal Glittergold 
was not pleased. While his gnomes were pay- playing useless games, the kobolds were busy working and were ready to emerge as a dominant race. And so with a wave of his, of his hand, Gal collapsed Kirtlemak's mine, smashing all the kobolds inside and, and trapping them. And the other gods demanded an explanation, but no deity came forward to reverse the damage done. Io, realizing that no god would help, searched the souls of those who died to find Kirtlemark still clinging to life, even buried under the mountain. He would not give up on his people. Io gave Kirtlemark a choice. He would empower Kirtlemark with the strength to rebuild the mine, or he would make the mighty kobold a champion of his people for all eternity. In the latter case, the, case, the lot of, loss of uh, Jarrah Strict 30 would remain, but the memory of what happened would never be forgotten. At, at least, those are the tales of the kobolds. How much of truth there is to it, who knows, but they're interesting stories. The other main gods worshipped by the kobolds are Gek Nuld Ak, the god of protection, stealth, trickery, and traps. Gek Nuld Ak uh, was a protector god who didn't just protect, but also teaches the kobolds how to defend themselves through innovations. He will often appear as a small, dark kobold with white hair. He wears a cloak with bulging pockets and carries a hand axe and a cauldron from which he can draw several items, even magical, uh, minor magical ones, which are then used by intelligent people to fool other people. He is very pragmatic and hates being involved and embroiled by Kirtlemak in fights that were not of his own making, particularly through the obsession Kirtlemak has with his aggression against the gnomes. And he was not surprised when Kirtlemak went chasing after after Gal Glitigal to retrieve some magical um, rod that the gnome stole from Tiamat. Uh, that's another story. Gek uh, Nullak was allied with Dak- Dakarnok, and his superior was Kirtlemak. For the most part, he lives in the realm of ak Rak, um, the first layer uh, on th- the plane of the bleak eternity of Jehenna, which is called Kalis. gak uh, holy symbol is a cauldron with whirling ellipses. Dekarnok was a shamanic chieftain who conquered all the other Kogol dens near his own tribe and then moved against human and gnome settlements scattered along his frontier. He enjoyed considerable military success, specialising in fast, light raids. It is said that Dakarnok gained godhood through the use of certain magical devices. Whatever the means, upon his death, his people continued to revere him, and Dakarnok is usually depicted as an enormous muscular kobold with uh, silver-black scales and tiny red eyes, wielding a spiked club made from oak. Um, and also they carried on this tradition in which most of the sort of minor gods of the kobold religious tradition are revered ancient heroes of their people. So they're not actually gods per se, they're just ancestor worship. Um, Kuri, Kura Ulyek appears as a blue-skinned dragon wrought kobold or as a blue-skinned erd with feathered wings. He is deeply cowardly and would never send his single avatar outside his plane unless he's, um, his chosen Erd race was in deadly peril. More often, he would send a huge Mobat to aid one of his priests instead. Uh, Kura Ulyek's realm is known as Erdress. Um, he hides in his gloomy cave in Jehenna, seldom leaving his bit dismal home for fear of Kirtlemak's wrath, and the lair is defended by a force of monstrous Mobats. Erd have their own version of kobold history, and this is recorded in the Treatise Historical of the Dragon Tyrants. It is reco- recounted that around minus 24,500 Dale Reckoning, early members of the kobold race mated with chromatic dragons to produce the first dragon wrought kobolds. These dragon wrought kobolds came to work in teams known as Wings, or Erds in the Draconic language. The leader of the Erds in those days was a blue dragon wrought kobold named. Kura, uh, Kura Ulyek. Kura Ulyek led the Erds away from the Kobold homeland in order to escape the first rage of dragons, settling in bat haunted caverns beneath what was later called the Thunder Peaks. Without the Erds to watch over the Kobold lands, the dragon Kaysen's Jack slaughtered most of those Kobolds who survived Gal Glitigold's collapse of their caverns. When Kirtlemak became divine, he vowed revenge on the cowardly Kura Ulyek for deserting the kobolds in their hour of need. But Askarath made Kura Ulyek, man, that's a hard word, divine as well. 
The new god fled to Jehenna, where he remains to this day, still fearful of Kirtlemach's retribution. Erds are mostly found in the Star Spire Mountains um, in County Starspur in Tethir these days, while kobolds have spread from the ruins of, the gen- of their genesis across the world and many others. To put this time period into further context, context it was not until about 24,000 DR, minus 24,000 DR, 500 years later, that the Great Worms, a cabal of very old and powerful dragons of the southern lands, continuously assaulted the cities of Mershulk, uh, causing the Yuan Ti Empire to fall into decline. It was around this 500 year period where the true horror of the Rage of Dragons effects was truly evident to the draconic philosophers um, so that their religious fighting was, well, they consider it idiotic, and that gods who allowed such a terrible curse to befall their entire race were not at all worthy of their worship. This started the dragon's apathy towards the gods. They basically stopped worshipping them because they wouldn't fix the uh, dragon rage, which has lasted for thousands and thousands of years. But with the dragon rage now over, thanks to the Archmage Samaster, the dragons are once more starting to pick up with their activity. The cult of the dragon is now far more openly active, and the future dominance of the humans on the world um, of Toril in the land of Faerun, well... I guess we shall see. One last note. In the world of Mastara, home of the D&D Basic Edition, Kirtlemark is known as the Shining One, and I have no idea why. Just a reminder, if you've not subscribed already, feel free to do so, and be sure to hit the like button and the notification bell as I upload from the other side of the world from sometime in your future. For access to all of the scripts and one week advanced access to these videos, consider becoming a patron a patron of the channel on Patreon for a minimum of just $1 per month. Join the community on our Discord server, come say hi. Also, if you want to pick up a new video game at a significant daily discount and help me out in the process and check back um, daily because they've got different video games every single day, quite often with a significant discount, check the daily deal on Chrono. Link down below in the description text along with a link to my mug merchandise which is available for you to buy and brew up a nice thick brew of coffee to make it through these very long lore videos. As always, thanks for listening. I'll be back with more for you again very soon. Well, <laughs> And